how do we adapt the human body to stress of this kind for periods of multiple years? What what lessons do you draw from that study and other experiments in space that give you an indication of how we can survive for multiple years? I think we know that the radiation is, is one of the biggest risk factors, and this has been well described by NASA and many other ast astronauts and, and researchers. And so there, we don't have to just measure the radiation or just look at DNA being damaged. We can actually actively repair it. This happens naturally in all of our cells. There's little enzymes, little protein, um, and m really many machines that go around and scan DNA for nicks and breaks and repair it. We could improve them. We could add more of them, or you can even activate them before you go into space. So we have a, one set of cells in my lab where you, but you activate them before we irradiate them to actually prepare them for the dose of radiation. And now that is you know, what's called epigenetic uh, G CRISPR therapies, where you can actually, instead of adding or taking away a gene or modifying a cell, you just change kind of how it's packaged. Like I was just describing that the DNA, the genes are still there. We're just changing how they get used. And so you can actually preemptively activate a DNA repair genes. And we've done this for cells. We haven't done this yet for astronauts, but we've done it uh, for cells. And a, a similar idea to this is being used to treat uh, sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. As you, act, you can reactivate a gene that was dormant in, in, as, a way, as a therapy. So should we make human genes resilient to harsh conditions or should we get good at repairing them? I wanna, I wanna get good at I, I, Okay, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. I think every time I ask this question, you have both. taught me <laughs> that there's always a third option to right. say both. I will say both. <laughs> I know, uh, you know, for, for copy, it's good to just have one big statement, but uh, but you want to do both, good or, or a third option. I would want to, you know, do electromagnetic shielding. I would want to do a fourth option of, you know, maybe some other uh, kind of physical defenses. So outside of the human body. Yeah, so we're taking the same passion to keep astronauts safe that's outside them and just putting it in their cells is what I propose. And now it's a bit radical today because uh, you know we're just starting this in clinical trials to treat you know diseases on earth. So it's not ready, I think, to do in astronauts, but in the book I proposed by about the year 2040, that's when we'd reach this next phase where I think we'll have known enough about the clinical response. We'll have the technology ironed out. That's about when it's time, I think, to try it. So what are the, some interesting early milestones so you said uh, 2040, what do we have to look forward to in the next 10, 20 years, according to your book, according to your thoughts? A lot of really exciting developments where if you really want to activate genes, like I was just describing, or, or, or repair a specific disease gene, you can actually CRISPR it out, modify it. This has been already published and well-documented. But uh, as I was alluding to, more and more we'll see people that you just want to temporarily change your genes functions and change their activity. So the best example, this is for beta thalassemia. We all have hemoglobin in our blood that carries oxygen around. And when you're an adult, it's a different version. It's a different gene. You have one gene when you're a fetus called fetal hemoglobin. When you're an adult, you have a different gene, but they both are making a protein that carries oxygen. When you, after you're born, the fetal hemoglobin gene gets just turned off, it just it goes away and you replace it with adult hemoglobin. But if your gene for hemoglobin is bad as an adult, that one of the therapies is, well, let's turn back on the gene that you had when you were a fetus. And it's actually already led to cures for sickle cell and beta thalassemia in this past year. So it's this extraordinary idea of like, well, well, you already have some of the genetic solutions in your body. Why don't we just reactivate them and see if you can live? And indeed you can. So I think we'll see more of that. That's for severe disease, but eventually you could see it for more, uh, I think, work-related purposes. Like if you're working in a, in a dangerous mine or in a radio, a high radiation environment, you could, you could basically start to prime it for you know work safety, basically. We need to genetically protect you. Now, it would have to be shown that that genetic option is safe, reliable, uh, you know, that it's better, that at least as good or if not better than other shielding methods. But I think we'll start to see that more in the next 10, 20 years. And eventually, as I described in the book, you could get to recreational genetics. You could say, well, I wanna turn some genes on just for this weekend because I'm going to a high altitude so I'd like to prepare for that. And so instead of having to take weeks and weeks for acclimation, you could just do some quick epigenetic therapies and have a good time in the mountains and then come back and turn them back off. So this is stuff to do on earth yeah. across thousands of humans. And then you start getting good data about what the effects in the human body are. How do we make humans survive across an entire lifetime for well, let's say several decades in space? If it's just in space, it'll be hard because you'll, you'll need basically some gravity at some point. I think you'd need orbital platforms that give you at least some partial gravity, if not 1G. If you're on Mars, it's actually, you know, even though the gravity is 38% of Earth's, 
just having that gravity would be enough. And if you could get under the surface into some of the lava tubes where you have some protection above you uh, from the radiation, I think that would be, you probably could survive quite well there. So I think it's the, it, just in space part, that's hard. You'd need some gravity. You need some additional protection from the radiation. Can you uh, linger on the lava tubes mm -hmm. on Mars? What are the lava tubes on uh, Mars? Yes, yeah, so they are a bit like what they sound like. There were large masses of lava at one point on the planet pushing really quickly through the environment. And they created these, these, these basically these small caverns, which you could go in, in theory, and build a small habitat and, and puff it up, kind of like a blowing up a balloon, mm -hmm. and, and have a protective habitat. Basically, it's a little bit underground. So one of the next helicopter missions being planned at the Jet Propulsion Lab is to see if you can get a helicopter to go into the lava tube, and which is just, a, like as it sounds, kind of like take out a big worm that has burrowed into the landscape and leave out the hollow column that's left, and that's what your tubes look like. So uh, one of the future helicopters might even go explore one of them as a mission being planned right now. So they're accessible without significant amount of drilling? Yeah, that's the other advantage. Yeah, you can get to them because uh, some of them are exposed. You can do a little bit of drilling and then see essentially this entire and cavern. that protects you a little bit from the radiation. Because right, you have some soil above you basically, which would be a regolith, which would be nice. What about source of food? Uh, what's a good, so that's part of biology, how you power this whole thing. Yeah. What about source of food across decades? In space, we'd in have space. to, plants have been grown in flight and you can get some nutrients, but right now it is very reliant on all the up mass being sent up, all the you know, freeze dried fruit that then gets rehydrated, which doesn't taste awful, but is is not uh, is not self-reliant, right? So I think those would have to be small bioreactors. It'd have to be a lot of work on fermentation, a lot of work on, you know, potentially prototrophic organisms, the organisms that can make all of the 20 amino acids that you would need to eat. I describe a little bit in the book, what if we did a prototrophic human where you could have, like right now we need to we need to get some of our amino acids because we can't make them all, which I think is kind of sad. So what if we could make all of our own amino acids or all of our own vitamins? I also, you know, I think that's one case where another adaptation could be to activate the vitamin C gene. Like right, right now you'd have to have limes or some other source of vitamin C in space, but we actually carry the gene inside of our genome to make vitamin C. Look at dogs and cats, for example, they have these kind of wet noses, you don't see them going out and getting margaritas, uh, although dogs can drink beer and get drunk. They don't need vitamin C. They, they have no risk of scurvy because they can make the vitamin C all by themselves. So can other wet-nosed primates called strepsorinis. But we are dry-nosed primates and we, we lost this ability. Sometimes 10 or 20 million years ago, we no longer make our own vitamin C, but the gene for it is called gulo. It's still in our DNA. It's what's called a pseudogene. It's just broken down. It's like, a, it's like having a, like in our genome, we have these functional genes, like a nice BMW, a nice car that works well, but we also have this like wrecking, this like junkyard of old cars, old genes, old functions in our DNA that we could bring back. And so vitamin C is one of them that would be very easy to do. So then you could activate the gene, repair it basically, repair it so we can make our own vitamin C. Now we'd have to do it again carefully, because what if, if what if we lost vitamin C, the production of vitamin C as a species? What if it was a good reason that we lost it? Maybe it was helping in some other way that we mm -hmm. can't see now, but you'd start slowly, do it in cells, then do it you know, potentially in animal models and prim other primates and then try it in humans. But that's something else I'd like to see. So we wouldn't have to make as much food in orbit. You could actually start to make as much of your own food in your own cells. So the input to the system in terms of energy could be much more restricted. It doesn't have to have the diversity we currently need as humans. But I don't wanna be a robot. Humans love, and I, as I do, texture. Uh, I, I realized that made me sound like I wasn't human, but, but humans uh, love food and, yeah. and flavors and textures and smells. All, all, the, all of that is actually attenuated in flight. So it's, you'd wanna you'd not forget our humanity and sort of this, this you know, love of, uh, of all the benefits and wonder of food and cooking and smells. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Well, speak for yourself, because for me, I, I eat the same thing every single day and I, um, I find beauty in everything and some beauty is more easily accessible yeah. outside of earth and food is not one of those things, I think. <laughs> what about insects? Hmm. Uh, the people bring that up, basically food that has sex with itself and multiplies. <laughs> so cockroaches and True. so on, they're a source of a lot of um, the, the protein and a, a lot of the amino acids. Yeah. And bed bugs. There's a guy at the American Museum of Natural <laughs> History in New York. He loves bed bugs, Lou Sorkin, and he's, and he has a monthly meeting where he talks about how which insects would be the best for eating. And one one month he gave a whole talk about bed bugs that they're pretty gross, but in terms of the value of what you can get for protein, they're really good. So they're they're a good candidate. I think you'd have to, if you could deep fry them. If you deep fry anything, you can pretty much eat it. So maybe you need a fryer up in space, but they're a candidate. 